So we're looking at Europe, the beast that we were reading about in Revelation chapter 16. So let's just go and start with uh, prophecy and then we'll move on to current events. So we saw last time, uh, first session, uh, in Revelation chapter 12, the whole Roman world was under the description of a dragon, yeah, a pagan empire, uh, and the dragon was its symbol. And then in chapter 12 of Revelation, it describes how the dragon is conquered by Constantine and no longer becomes a, a pagan world, but a, a Christian world. And the man-child was caught up to heaven. The political heavens, Christianity, became the official religion. Uh, and the true bride, they had to flee. They were persecuted quite extensively and the truth was corrupted. And so we have the situation of the Emperor Constantine taking control of the Roman world. And the dragon symbol is recycled, as it were, no longer pagan. It now is a symbol of the military might of Rome and centres no longer in Rome, but in Constantinople, where uh, Constantine has set up his headquarters. So a, a recycling uh, of, of that symbol. And in chapter 13 of Revelation, we have a series of beasts that arise, uh, and it's telling us the history of Europe in the main, on the western side of Europe, uh, and we have such things as the beast of the sea, which arises, the first one, and uh, that is, uh, establishes itself uh, and depicts the western Roman world, uh, of the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries onwards. Uh, we then have a beast of the earth which arises uh, not from the Mediterranean uh, area but from the land area and this is the symbol that the scripture gives us of the Holy Roman Empire which arose from Germany which was a long way from the Mediterranean Sea and is depicted as uh, a creature which has uh, two horns, but uh, we'll look at that in a moment. So the dragon power, um, uh, and then the third one, sorry, yes, uh, was the image of the beast, where the papacy itself had its own lands and was a little miniature of the beast of the earth system, with the pope reigning as a king over his territory, uh, and it was a copy, an image of the beast of the earth. So eventually the symbol of the dragon has to move from Constantinople because of the invasions. It moves up to Moscow and Moscow becomes the seat of the dragon. But when we come to uh, the situation of today, the age in which we live, because uh, it, this passage that we read this morning finishes with the return of the Lord Jesus and the battle of Armageddon uh, and the verses we didn't read are the uh, description of the seventh vial being poured out upon the world of uh, Europe especially, the judgments that the Lord Jesus <coughs> will bring upon the nations. Uh, and the picture that is uh, painted is of a, a dragon and of a beast and of a false prophet. That's the world that we're living in today. Dragon power we have no problem with. Um, that, that is the uh, Russia, uh, which is corresponding to the military might of the old Roman Empire. But the beast, in the early part of uh, Revelation uh, 16 that we were reading, we saw all the judgments that God poured out upon the Catholic Europe, the French Revolution, and the breaking of the power, the, the um, uh, beast system that existed then. Uh, and yet... Here it is, it's still in existence. So what we're seeing is a revival of the uh, beast system, the beast of the earth, uh, and it's going to be in its last phase. And we also have a new symbol, uh, a false prophet. That's the first time in Revelation we have this uh, description uh, of uh, the papal system as a false prophet. Uh, and no longer the image of the beast because it's lost all its land, so it's no longer an image of a beast. 
But there is a new symbol of false prophet, and we shall see the significance and the uh, relevance of, of that symbol for the papacy of today. So let's just say a few words about the ending of the papal states. Um, Garibaldi was the final straw, as it were, that uh, kicked uh, the Pope in that cartoon out of Italy. Well, he didn't actually kick him out of Italy. The Vatican remained in, uh, the, the Pope remained in the Vatican City as a self-imposed uh, uh, exile. He didn't uh, move from the Vatican. And all the lands that the Pope had had were absorbed into the uh, Italian um, Republic. So that was the work of uh, Garibaldi. Now, the new symbol of a prophet, we know what a, a true prophet is. The true prophet speaks on behalf of God to his people. And we know that there were false prophets in the past who didn't say, speak the word of God, but made up words, pretended to be representatives of God and to teach the people. And we can see this as a very apt symbol of the power of the papacy and the false teaching. It deludes people that this is truth, that the Pope is God's representative, he is Christ on earth. And it came at a particularly uh, interesting time that makes this symbol so apt. Because it was in 1870, just at the time when the Pope lost all his lands, and the image of the beast uh, symbol uh, had come to an end, it was just then that the Pope claimed that he spoke from God, uh, papal infallibility. And it was the first Vatican Council in 1870 proclaimed the doctrine of infallibility when the Pope spake ex cathedra on Peter's throne. And if you didn't agree with that, well, you were accursed. That power has not been used very often. Uh, the only example of an ex-cathedra decree took place in 1950 when Pius XII defined the Assumption of Mary as an article of faith. But it, it just is so interesting. Here, the Lord Jesus uh, portrays a new symbol uh, and a false prophet. Very much that's what the Pope was saying. I speak God's words, but he doesn't indeed. So a false prophet is a, a very apt symbol. And the power that the Pope wields uh, is growing in recent times. It, it took a long time. The difficulties that the Vatican had through the beginning of the 1900s uh, was uh, quite severe. It was despised and rejected by the majority of nations but now they have come up in power. And I just slotted this one in that uh, he is a great tweeter and he's in the top 25. He's got 440 million followers in nine languages. Uh, he's just, uh, Trump is number 24 and he is number 25. It just gives you some idea of the popularity that this system has, the respect that... The world looks at this man uh, and regards him as God's representative upon the earth, a false prophet indeed. So going back to our Daniel chapter 2 symbol, uh, we see in the direction that this uh, image is going to take when it walks down into the land, marches down into the land of Israel to take it, that the eyes and the mouth that are directing it uh, belong to the papacy. That will be the power that directs the image and cooperates the eastern foot, the dragon foot, and the western foot, the European foot, to work together to come against Israel. Now, just going back to our beast, just to tease out just a little bit, but very, very briefly, um, the first beast that John saw in chapter 13 was the beast of the sea, and uh, it is very closely linked to the dragon power because it had seven heads and ten horns. Uh, and we saw when we looked at that, how that linked back to Daniel chapter 7 and the four beasts with having a total of seven heads and ten horns. And the dragon 
over in Constantinople, gave his power and seat and authority to this beast system. And we believe that this is a symbol for the Western Roman Christian world. We're told in verse 5 that it will continue for 42 months. And again, doing the same maths that we've done before, and we get the same answer of 1260 days, which we interpret as 1260 years. Uh, and we have these uh, uh, beginning periods when the uh, emperors in Constantinople gave power and authority over to Rome and uh, their ending date coming in the period of the French Revolution and its aftermath. The uh, beast of the earth, as I say, arose to the north and uh, is a very apt symbol for the uh, Holy Roman Empire phase of the Roman Empire uh, and that commenced AD 800 uh, with the crowning of uh, Charlemagne by Pope Leo as the emperor of the, um, Europe and church and state working together. The, there were two horns on this beast, uh, one horn representing the power of the emperor, the other horn representing the power of the papacy. And between the two of them, they held sway over uh, Europe until um, the ending of the power of the papacy in 1870. So there's an artistic uh, picture of the crowning of Charlemagne, 25th of December uh, in 800. That was the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire. As I say, the uh, arising out of that was the image, the copy of the beast, uh, and what the Pope uh, had set up with his own kingdom in Italy uh, was a miniature of that beast system, uh, and that runs from about 1087 when he first took over lands and ruled as a monarch, uh, and running out in 1870 when all those lands were taken away. So what we're seeing today is a revival of that uh, beast of the earth system with its Holy Roman Empire style with emperor, ruler, whoever is uh, the political power working with the religious power with the papacy. Now do we look at the beginning of the EU 1957 uh, as the beginning of the revival or is it probably more reasonable to see probably from this year next year with Britain actually coming out uh, we see tremendous changes taking place this year as we shall see in a moment uh, great changes taking place in Europe as they're driving towards the United States of Europe and we're seeing this coming together, the binding together of the nations to form a new Europe, a new beast system with the papacy at its heart. And so a revival of the old uh, beast of the earth. And then finally, when we come to Revelation chapter 17, we have this uh, picture of a woman uh, riding the beast, uh, Babylon, mystery of the great, so linking back to the things of Rome, and this, I believe, is going to be Western Europe in its final phase. But this is post-Armageddon. Armageddon has taken place in Revelation chapter 16. The dragon has been destroyed. The armies of Europe that were sent to uh, assist the dragon in invading Israel, they have been destroyed. The Lord Jesus has set himself up as king on Zion's throne. The Jews have been baptized into Christ in that fountain, that river that flows out from Jerusalem. Uh, and Jesus is reigning over Israel, uh, and the call is going out to the nations that they have to submit their thrones to him. He is the ruler of heaven and earth, the, the, the son of God, the ruler of heaven and earth. Uh, and it is that final stage that Europe rallies, because they say that this is Antichrist. They will not believe that this is really Jesus, because they have been imbued with this uh, Antichrist teaching which says that the day is going to come when a person is going to arise establishing himself as a king, do battle with Russia and do all the things that Jesus is going to do, build the temple and all that kind of thing. 
Uh, and so they're going to say this is Antichrist. And in chapter 17, we have this final picture of Europe rallying together to resist uh, the challenge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the language of, Revela of Daniel chapter 7, that fourth beast's power has got to be totally destroyed. Other nations are allowed to exist in the kingdom if they submit to the Lord Jesus. So, again, going back to our center stone, as it were, of Daniel's uh, chapter 2, the image, uh, we see that the uh, western leg goes through various phases, the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, and now just the beast. Uh, and uh, on the other side, the dragon uh, and the false prophet as the eyes and mouth. So this is the Roman kingdoms of men which are beginning to come together. Now, we've looked at this, uh, I'm pretty sure we did look at this before, um, but uh, again, just to reconnecting, just to show the importance that just at the time when the final remnants of the uh, legs came to an end in World War I. Uh, their main power had been broken earlier, but uh, they, they dragged on, as it were, uh, until the end of World War I. And that was just the very time that God used to uh, bring Britain into Palestine, to open up a homeland, to say to the Jews, you can go back. And so we, we can see that we're in this era where Israel back in their land, that the, the feet, the final stage, the feet and toes uh, can be developed. And we see the importance uh, of Britain as a member of the EU, um, but we'll come back to that. So we're in this exciting stage of things beginning to happen, so, but we're concentrating on the western side. So the beast of the earth is the first German empire, uh, either 800 with Charlemagne, others uh, started at uh, 962, but I think uh, the 800 Charlemagne start is correct because that's where the EU of today looks at the origin of the EU that it wants to form today. It looks to Charlemagne as its role. Charlemagne Prize awarded every year. So that's the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, but that matters not. It was the first German empire. Uh, and so we have the emperor and we have the pope working together. Now that came to an end. The second German Reich it was a much shorter lived one. Uh, 1871 to 1918 came to an end in World War I. Uh, and uh, the third Reich was uh, under Germany, 1933 to 1945, when it looked as if Germany was going to conquer the world, uh, but Britain and uh, her allies helped to smash, uh, together with Russia, uh, smash that power. And so that came to an end. And now we've moved on over 70 years from uh, the ending of that third German Reich, and we begin to see the fourth German Reich uh, growing. Uh, and I believe that uh, we're going to see a lot, lot, lot more in changes. And it's quite remarkable. The, the first empire lasted a long time, but came to an end in 1806. Second Reich came to an end in 1918. Third Reich came to an end in 1945. And here we are today, and what do we see in Germany? We see the growing power of Germany, the heart of the EU, uh, physically, um, but politically and economically. Uh, it is the biggest of the EU countries, uh, Germany, France, and then the UK. UK is just about to overtake France, but then UK is not going to be a member of the EU. But it, Germany is the biggest of the EU countries, countries by population. If we look at the GDP, it is number four in the world. So we've got America, China, Japan, and then Germany, and then the UK. So this country, which was smashed and smashed and smashed and smashed, growing in power again. Gold reserves. Germany has been very busy buying up gold, and she now has the number two in quantity of gold, more than the IMF has. 
So that if, in a changed circumstance, she wanted to go back to the Deutschmark, set up a new currency just for an exclusive number of countries, she has got the gold to back it. Um, unlike Britain with her currency and America with the dollar, uh, Germany has got the gold reserves to back her currency. And as far as exports are concerned, she's number three in the world. This country, <laughs> smashed to pieces, is now the third biggest exporting country in the world. So China, States and Germany. And Mrs. Merkel, this was uh, Forbes earlier in the year before the German elections, uh, re-voting her for I don't know how many times, many, many times, as the most powerful woman in the world. Um, but of course we know that things are rather grim for her at the moment, but we will come to that at the moment. But uh, un un until just a few months ago, a very powerful leader uh, in Angela Merkel. So we need to look at the partner that Germany has to help her in this revival, and that is the Vatican. The Vatican has been working with Germany um, because the Vatican wants what Germany wants. Germany wants to become an empire again. The Vatican wants to have power again. And as she backed Germany in World War II, backed Hitler uh, and failed, and then, uh, as we shall see, the EU sprang out of the ideas that uh, Hitler had, um, the Vatican is very much working with Germany to make Germany strong in order that she can be strong. So, let's uh, just go back to the papacy and see the, how the papacy ha has grown in power over the past 150 years, from the time when the, uh, Napoleon took away the papal states, uh, and then Napoleon then restored them, uh, and then Garibaldi uh, finally finishes things off. And the Pope then is a, a prisoner, uh, and during that time onwards and into the 1920s, 1930s, the Vatican City, the rats ran around the corridors, the roofs leak. It was in a terrible state, great poverty. And what transformed the Vatican was an alliance which the Vatican made with Italy. It was the Lateran Treaty. And this was Italy's way of compensating the church for taking all the lands from her way back in the 1870. And uh, the, uh, the negotiator on the part of the uh, Vatican was Cardinal Parcelli, who was the Pope past the 12th, the one that was through the war. Uh, he had a brother who was a very skilled lawyer, and he got his brother to draw up this agreement between the Vatican and the Italian government. And uh, that agreement gave uh, the Vatican 90 million uh, US dollars, or the equivalent thereof, uh, which in today's terms, because this is uh, 1929, that's uh, 1.27 billion pounds. So that was a big sum of money to be handed over to this uh, poverty um, church. Uh, and what the Vatican did was to very shrewdly invest it. The older members here will be acquainted with uh, Manhattan's books on uh, the Vatican against Europe and the Vatican billions. Uh, this is a more recent book by Paul Williams, The Vatican Exposed, Money, Murder and the Mafia. It's quite a fascinating book, but it, it explains how this money that uh, it received was very shrewdly invested in stocks and shares and companies, especially in Italy. It controls a large proportion of Italian companies and real estate. And If any of you drive an Alfa Romeo, then they're very much uh, a Roman Catholic uh, company. Uh, owned by the uh, Vatican. And uh, subsequently to uh, World War II, the Vatican invested a lot of its money out of Europe into America, 
and the Vatican is in America the largest US property portfolio outside the US government. And that Latin treaty is still in force uh, and under it it paid the money for the clergy, for the churches. And in 1984, it was slightly modified, which was to the advantage of the Vatican. Uh, so instead now of all the wages being paid by the Vatican, when the Italians pay their taxes, or should I say if the Italians pay their taxes, um, they, uh, a proportion of it, uh, Otto per Miller, uh, eight in a thousand, point eight percent of their personal tax and goes to the church. Um, a bit more complicated than that. On the form you have a box in which you tick to say where you want your 0.8% to go. Uh, Vatican is one, the Lutheran, Jewish synagogues, there are three other churches, or the state welfare fund. Only about 37% actually bother to tick the box. Uh, in Further back in time it was uh, 60, 70, 80% ticked. But it doesn't matter because if you don't tick the box, you still pay your 0.8%. And the government just says, well, of those people that tick boxes, what proportion were to the Vatican and 37%? Right, so all the money from those that didn't tick the box, the same proportion will go. So 30%, 37% of all these 0.8% go to the church. Uh, and that uh, the latest figure I can find, because the Vatican doesn't boast about this income it receives, but uh, in 2012, that was a 1.3 billion US dollars worth of income to the church. So quite uh, an interesting thing. Now, that was, let's say, the Lateran Treaty was a, a great boost for the Catholic Church. And they saw that if they could do the same thing with Germany, that again would be to their great advantage. And they did. And so uh, Parcelli, with uh, his uh, a brother, who was the, the, the lawyer, drew up an agreement uh, with Germany. Now, I can't speak German, so I'm not going to even try and pronounce what the, the Reich Concordat, but uh, that's roughly what it is. But this was uh, in 1933. And the uh, Hitler's government and the Vatican signed this agreement and uh, the representative of the German government was a devout Catholic, von Papen, and he said the Third Reich, Hitler's Third Reich, is the first world power which not only acknowledges but also puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. And this is from a book on Adolf Hitler. Uh, the Vatican was so appreciative of being recognised as a full partner that it asked God to bless the Reich. On a more practical level, it ordered German bishops to swear allegiance to the National Socialist regime. The new oath concluded with these significant words, in the performance of my spiritual office and in my solicitude for the welfare and interests of the German Reich, I will endeavour to avoid all detrimental acts that might endanger it. So they gave wholehearted support to the work of um, Hitler. And... Uh, they seem to have changed the cover of the book, but if you want to have a look at the book, it's there. Um, the Pope helps Hitler to world power, uh, how the cross courted the swastika for eight years. It's quite an interesting document. Far from being threatened by the Nazis, the government subsidies which the Catholic Church enjoyed under his predecessors was tripled under Hitler. Between 1933, when he took office, and 1938, it rose from 150 million marks a year to 500 million marks. He left the Roman church the richest landowner in South and West Germany. It drew 1.5 billion marks a year from its property alone. So from this uh, concordat, the money that they received from Germany uh, was huge. Uh, and with this uh, land that they owned and property that they owned, they had this incredible income. Now this uh, concordat was being signed at a time when Hitler was making clear what his attitude to the Jews was. 
Um, so the Concordat was, uh, I think, June, July 33, but so this is in August, in April uh, 33. Um, Hitler says, I I've been attacked because of my handling of the Jewish question. The Catholic Church considers the Jews pestilent for 500, 1,500 years, put them in ghettos, etc., because it recognised the Jews for what they were. I'm moving back toward the time in which a 1,500-year-long old tradition was implemented. I do not set race over religion, but I recognize the representatives of this race as pestilent for the state and for the church, and perhaps I am therefore doing Christianity a great service by pushing them out of schools and public functions. So he's quite open about his attitude to the Jews, uh, at the time when he was making this concordat with the Roman Catholic Church, and there was no objections from it. And much, much earlier, this uh, letter um, came onto the market in 2011, and the Simon Wiesenthal Centre bought it for £90,000, uh, uh, British pounds. Uh, and in this letter, which uh, Hitler wrote in 1919, uh, he wrote that a government could tackle the so-called Jewish question by denying their rights, but said the final aim, however, must be the uncompromising removal of the Jews altogether. So here was a power, a persecuting power against not only the saints, but also against God's people, the Jews. And he was acclaimed by the people in Nuremberg, the crowds cheered and exalted him, and he was determined to set up an empire. He had fetched from um, uh, ba, 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 Vienna, says that, didn't it? Hitler had brought from Vienna the insignia of the First Reich, the imperial crown, the orb of the empire scepter, and the imperial sword. He solemnly vowed that they would remain in the Nuremberg forever. And they were very busy setting up what we will call the EU. Uh, they, he had uh, plans for a Europe which are identical to the plans that have become a reality in the EU. So this is back in 1942. Uh, in the middle of the war, they're having a conference in Germany. Uh, I can't even begin to pronounce the German title, but it translated uh, the e European Economic Community. And what they were looking at was how to... Uh, have uh, an, an economic face of the new Europe. Uh, they were talking about developing a European economic community. That's, uh, they were looking at transport, having common railway systems and transport systems, a common currency, they were, that's what they were talking about, that's what they were desiring. And the fundamental question, is Europe a geographical concept or a political fact? And that today is the great question. Is Europe just an amalgam of all these different nations? Or is Europe a United States of America, but in Europe, a uh, political unity? And that's what they're driving for today. And that's what Hitler was planning. Next year, another draft, the basic elements of a plan for the new Europe. And they're talking about customs unions uh, and uh, how they could uh, work out so a common... Uh, Customs for this new empire that Germany was building. Um, a clearing center for financial tri transactions. And again, having one currency, a common currency for the whole area. Now, the founding fathers of the EU, who lived through this time and were involved in some extent to it, they were all Roman Catholics. Uh, and some of them are on their pathway to sainthood uh, if a miracle can be proved. We know it's absolute rubbish and that, but this is just to illustrate that the EU of today is very much founded on uh, Roman Catholic ideas and principles uh, and uh, matters. Now, um, just as in Italy, the uh, agreement that was made uh, brought money into the church so the same thing happens in Germany. Uh, they have their Kirchensteuer, which is their church tax. Um, very similar system to what operates in uh, Italy. 
and that brings into the church seven billion dollars, US dollars a year. And the Roman Catholic Church in Germany is the country's biggest private employer, absolutely massive. The other thing we know is that so many of the symbols of the EU are based upon uh, religion. The, the 12 stars, nothing to do with the system that America has, the stars representing states. These stars, the 12 stars were taken, the flag was designed at a time when there were 15 EU members. And it is very clearly and very openly based upon the 12 stars of Revelation chapter 12, the halo around Mary. Mary, of course, is the queen of Europe. Uh, there is a coin from uh, uh, Gibraltar with Our Lady of Europe, an ordinary 20p piece. And uh, in 1979, John Paul II uh, officially approved her title as Our Lady of Europe uh, and moved her feast day to May the 5th, which is the day that Europe celebrates Europe Day, the day that uh, the EU came into being. But the, the 12 stars on the flag are, are taken from such statues as this, which is in Rome. You can see the stars there. And the person that designed it very openly said, yes, it was based upon that. And he, in fact, belonged to this uh, Order of Miraculous Medal, and he wore this medal with its 12 stars around it, uh, and symbolising Mary, uh, and he was the one who designed the European flag. We have seen this year tremendous steps to get to a United States of Europe, a European beast. So it started in March with the Rome Declaration, when they met in Rome and made that declaration. Then in September, the uh, Juncta, who is the uh, Commissioner of the EU, gave his State of the Union speech. Uh, and then in, uh, two weeks later, the new French President gave his speech, and we'll look at these in a moment. And again, cartoonists, uh, we in Britain, uh, the cartoonists look at Britain moving away from the EU. From the EU's perspective, they have their cartoons of the EU moving away from Britain. Uh, and very interesting, the two have got to be separated. So we mentioned this uh, Rome birthday, uh, and I just want to do one quote from uh, John Redwood, his uh, British MP, writes uh, a daily diary, has some very interesting insights into what is actually going on with the EU Brexit talks. But his comment on the, uh, the declaration that was made at the end of the birthday party, where they declared that the construction of the European unity is a bold, far-sighted endeavour. We are working towards a United States of Europe. And in his comment, he says, now we know what the EU wants without the UK. The Rome Declaration, signed last weekend, sets out the full scheme for the Union. It is, as Eurosceptics described, as the Declaration says, we have built a unique union with common institutions and strong values. Unity is both a necessity and our free choice. Our union is undivided and indivisible. In other words, these disparate countries we're saying we want to be one country, we want to give up our rights, we want to be a United States of Europe. And the document sets out four large areas where the Union will now be strengthened. First is the freedom of movement, that people are totally free to come and go anywhere within the uh, EU. The second, the single currency will be stable and further strengthened by everybody having to be part of the EU. Um, Third is a social Europe with EU-wide benefit and social policies. And fourth is a stronger Europe in a global scene, committed to strengthening its common security and defence in a common defence supply industry. In other words, a military. So, he says, there we have it. It was the creation of a large new state after all. What the EU had denied 
that it was political uh, now is fully revealed. That's their aim, a political union. And uh, a few months later, Mrs. Merkel, having been visited by President Trump, uh, Trump saying to Europe, you can't depend upon uh, America and NATO to defend you unless you put more money in. And uh, she gave this uh, little speech saying the time in which we can fully count on others is somewhat over, as I have experienced in the past few days. We can't rely on United States or Britain. We must fight our own destiny. We must take our destiny in our own hands. And that is what they have been doing this past few months. In June was the French elections and this young man, uh, the Republic on March, um, the Republic on the Move party is a new party, it was only founded in 2016, and he emerged a strong winner, a young man, very popular, uh, and uh, he has big plans for Europe. France and Germany traditionally have been the driving forces behind the EU. And now there is uh, a dynamic young man, and we await a dynamic German to come and join him. But then a few months on from that was uh, Juncker's uh, uh, State of the Union. Every year, the, uh, whoever is the commissioner uh, delivers this State of the Union speech. Uh, the previous year, in 2016, it was very gloomy. Britain had just voted to leave. Uh, the economy was very bad, uh, and it was all uh, full of gloom and doom. But not this year. This year, the economy is beginning to improve in the EU. Uh, the winds of change were sweeping through. Britain, right, well, she has decided to leave. We're going to make the most of that. And he set out his stall for a United States of Europe. All members had to be, would have to be in the Euro. Uh, he ruled out any membership of Turkey because it was so alien, it was going in completely the wrong direction. Uh, she wanted a public prosecutor with cross-border, uh, being able to prosecute across borders. In other words, a common uh, single entity which could go into any of the EU countries to uh, prosecute. East to West, Europe must breathe with both her lungs, picking up the language of uh, John Paul II. By 2025, 2025, we need a fully fledged European Defence Union, we need an army, and we need a stronger economic and monetary union. Now, fascinatingly, the Telegraph um, cartoonist drew that as a Roman emperor giving speech to his Roman people. How spot on was that? And uh, that's, uh, I've had to pay for it, but uh, that's uh, on the front cover of the uh, uh, new milestones. I, I can get permission for lots of things, but uh, I had to pay for the reproduction rights on that one there. But it, it does encapsulate everything I've been talking about. That, Rome is the basis of it all. It is the kingdoms of men driven by Rome. And what was emerging in the EU is not just an isolated political thing. It is very much driven by the Vatican and driven by Rome. And two weeks later, uh, Macron, having got his feet on the ground, uh, gave his speech. And again, he looked for similar things, deeper Euro integration. He too believes that every member of the EU should be in the Euro. Uh, he pushed very strongly for their own army, the European Defence Force. He wanted to see a profound transformation of the EU with deeper political integration. Um, what his drive is, is at the moment we've got a Germany, we've got a France, we've got Spain and Italy and all these different countries. He wants Europe to think as one unit. Uh, and so this, this next one, Common Education and Universities, instead of going to a German university or a French university, he wants to set up EU universities so that young people begin to think 
Not that they are French, but that they are Europeans. And if we... I'm going to say, if we get there, we're not going to get there, are we? I've just slotted in the slides. Well, I'll tell you what it is, um, because we're not going to get there. There was, there was in the Telegraph today... The EU are talking about having Team EU in the Olympics in 2036. Um, instead of having, you know, France and Germany all competing against each other, let's all join together and then we'll beat Britain, um, which has irks them that uh, Britain operates on her own, comes number two in the medal tables, and all this whole EU, all their medals together, would beat Britain, but because they're all individuals, they don't. So. Um, but th this is their thinking. Think European. Um, a beast system, giving their allegiance to it. Um, harness sovereignty and democratic unity. And pan European political parties. He wants to do a similar thing with political parties. Instead of having a, a French party and a German party and all that, have a European party and just concentrate on that instead of having uh, individual uh, national elections. So, you no, know, the, these are all uh, great dreams. So, let's, um, let's just skip. So, the EU itself has, uh, in this is 24th of October, put forth a, an agenda for a more united and stronger, more democratic Europe. And they are pressing ahead with all the plans that are being made, so they're not going to... Uh, lose any ground, they want to move very rapidly with this integration, making uh, a United States of Europe. Uh, Germany had her bitter uh, results there uh, and is now in a very weak position, still can't find a partner and has had to go back and is now in discussions with the SD SPD party, which said that they didn't want to be a partner anymore, but having failed to find any other parties, she's now in talks with them. Uh, and the leader very much has these same thoughts, the United States of Europe by 2025, etc., etc. So we shall see what happens there. In Austria, a new young man comes to the force there, building their uh, uh, armies, very significant uh, step taken uh, in uh, November, when they all agreed towards a united uh, military. Which is what we'd expect, because the beast has got to come against Christ, so they're going to have an army. So we see that step by step, they've been enlarging their territory, uh, seamless borders, which you need if you have a United <coughs> States, a common currency, uh, and a common army. All these steps towards um, uh, a common thing. So why now? Well, they are worried about Russia rising, the Islamic threat. They are worried about Brexit and the United States withdrawing and don't like Donald Trump and this anti-NATO feeling. The angels have made sure that everything has come together to make the European leaders power ahead. And I think we're going to see tremendous changes in the next few years. So quite an exciting time, brothers and sisters. Thank you.